Okay, now we'll take up the cardiovascular system. Uh, as a reminder, it is part of the uh, section, uh, second section of this uh, whole entire section. So these notes are uh, section three, part two. The first part was blood, which was in fact part of the cardiovascular system anyway. So uh, let's take a look again at the overview. Um, the cardiovascular system, as we've mentioned for the blood section, has three main components, the heart, the vessels, and the blood. Cardio means heart, vascular means vessels. Uh, so uh, the heart and vessels are two of the components. The third one is the blood, which is in the heart and vessels. Uh, it is also known as the circulatory system. Uh, that's the functional name because that helps blood circulate through the body. Its primary function is to deliver nutrients. Uh, and uh, remove wastes, but uh, it does other things like we talked about. It protects itself from clotting uh, for blood. It helps regulate temperature. Uh, we also saw that uh, it helps uh, protect us in terms of uh, the immune system as well. So there's various uh, functions of the cardiovascular system. Uh, humans have a closed system. Uh, a closed cardiovascular system basically says that uh, the capillaries are the sites of exchange and that these uh, series of interconnected tubes um, arthropods uh, mollusks and, and other organisms have what's called an open system um, and what happens is the heart kind of just sprays the organs with it's not even called blood in most cases it's called hemolymph um, and then that kind of passively drains back to the heart but notice here there's no interconnected system that we see like we do in other areas so notice here in this area right here there's no interconnected vessels where as in uh, the human system we would see a, a, a group of interconnected uh, vessels so this is an example of the human system where we have these interconnected vessels here where uh, each, sorry, uh, each capillary, right, is where it serves the exchange. So these are meant to be the capillaries right here. So there's our capillary. So that's called a closed system. A uh, closed system sort of a misnomer because uh, it doesn't mean it's completely closed. It just means it's interconnected. So, and that's, you know, it's an earthworm there, but uh, humans and, and most what we call higher animals have a closed system. So let's look at the heart and kind of talk about some of the different things involved with the heart. Uh, the heart has four chambers, normally speaking, in humans. Uh, as an example for the frog laboratory, uh, we didn't dissect the frog heart, but if we had it only has three cha three chambers. It's got two atria and one ventricle. But the humans have four, um, and most mammals have four chambers. Um, it has two upper chambers called the atria, and it's got two lower chambers called the ventricles. Uh, you can see them on the outside of the heart right here by convention usually this heart is uh, pointing towards you so your left side of the screen would be the right atrium right here there's the oracle the little flap above it and then the left atrium right is going to be over on this side that's the oracle there and then the right ventricle and then the left ventricle one of the easier identifications is the left ventricle has what's called the apex that's the point of the heart so that would be associated with the left ventricle. Um, from the uh, atria, the atria are the receiving chambers. They receive blood from the, the right side, from the systemic circulation. That's most of the body. And on the left side, it receives uh, blood from the lungs, the pulmonary system. Um, and so their job is uh, to just either hold or transfer blood to the ventricles. So they're not very large uh, in terms of size. Uh, the walls are fairly thin because they don't have to generate a whole lot of pressure um, because they're pumping literally right next door and in many cases downhill. So they tend to be fairly thin walled. The lower chambers are the ventricles. Uh, the ventricles are the pumps. They're the major pumps of the body. They are more muscular as we'll see in a second. Uh, the right ventricle pumps to the lungs and the pulmonary system so it comes out here the pulmonary trunk and splits to the right and left pulmonary arteries 
and then the left ventricle pumps to the rest of the body so it pumps to everything else and that comes off the top of the heart and aorta right so here's our aortic arch right here at the top and it's by far the thickest layer that we'll see um, if we kind of divide it this way we can look and easily see the different chambers of the heart so we put this little triangle not triangle the little cross here uh, with the dashed lines and so up here on the inside we have the right atrium and you can see the very very thin wall right here okay so there's a very thin wall you see the same thing on the left atrium the top here uh, you see the valves we'll talk about a little later um, and then we'll see underneath the right atrium is the right ventricle notice it's got a thicker wall than the atria and then the other side is the left ventricle notice how thick that wall is again to pump blood to the rest of the body you know the left ventricle has to move blood to the top of your head the tip of your fingers the tip of your toes and everywhere in between uh, we need a much larger pump to be able to generate a higher pressure so we can push the blood further uh, one thing to kind of remember overall when we're talking about blood flow blood pressure things which we will to a large extent in this section is blood moves because of a pressure difference it's going to move from a higher pressure to a lower pressure and that's really really important scientifically as well as physiologically um, and it's an important concern that you probably um, uh, should remember in the back of your head because that'll help you uh, figure things out uh, so uh, when we look at the pump in general right you can kind of just well obviously your heart looks more like this right then this um, you can kind of see very easily divide up the heart into these these four sections um, let's start in the right atria and kind of look at blood through the heart just kind of an anatomy type uh, question but uh, we start in the right atrium all right so we'll just start there it's a it's a circuit which means it goes in a complete circle and you can start anywhere but typically by convention we start in the right atrium so if we start in the right atrium we can uh, look and go okay we're going to go from the right atrium and go to the right ventricle while not shown here we'll go back shown here we go through what's called the uh, tricuspid valve or sometimes known as the left atrial ventricular valve that's because it's at the junction between the atria and the ventricle all right so um you know you can kind of see the outside here much harder to much more difficult to see so we'll kind of stay with uh, these two um, so we go through the valve, the uh, right atrioventricular valve, into the right ventricle. Okay, so the right ventricle, uh, the right ventricle is going to pump, and you can kind of see it here very clearly. All right, the arrows are shown in blue because this is the deoxygenated blood. This is coming from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. Okay, now we'll talk about it later, but a large portion probably two-thirds or more of the blood flow passively from the right atrium to the right ventricle okay and so that's what our blue arrows are showing because this came from the rest of the body and it's already gone through tissues it's got less oxygen so this is often said to be deoxygenated blood um, it's kind of a misnomer because there's still a, plenty of oxygen here um, we mentioned in the blood section you can calculate what's called the percent saturation the percent saturation uh, on our venous side in most humans is about 70 percent which means seven out of ten hemoglobin sites are carrying oxygen even at this point in time now if you look at the right side i'm uh, sorry the left side over here with the red these came from the lungs we'll get kind of the circulation in a second but since these came from the lungs they've picked up oxygen and that's why they're shown in red and most people this is 97 98 you know usually 99 percent saturated uh, so there is a drop in saturation but there's still plenty of oxygen here and as an example um, if you take a class in cpr as a lay person you know a very short you know life support you know one for the community uh, they will not teach you how to do breaths anymore they just do compressions and uh, that's because there's still enough oxygen left to be circulating to provide enough oxygen for someone, especially if they're unconscious, uh, to live. So um, that's the what happens on this side. So from the right atrium, we go through the AV valve, the right AV valve, or the tricuspid valve, because it's got three cusps. Right? 
we go into the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts and that pushes the blood out. To get to the pulmonary trunk, it has to go through what is often called the, the semilunar valve, sometimes called the right semilunar valve, but more often than not, because this goes to the lungs, this is called the pulmonic valve or the pulmonary semilunar valve right here. That leads to the pulmonary trunk, and that goes, again, to the right side of the lungs to deliver oxygen, and the left side, so we call the left and right and left pulmonary arteries. So um, eventually it gets to the alveoli where it exchanges oxygen, uh, picks up oxygen from your alveoli, uh, releases CO2 into your alveoli, and then comes back. When it comes back, look at right here. So kind of go back to the really simple drawing. Oh, little simple drawing. Uh, it's going to come back to the left atrium. All right. So this comes from the lungs. And so from the left atrium, it'll come back via these vessels right here. Okay, so notice these vessels are shown in blue. Uh, sorry, red, not blue. Um, this pulmonary trunk is blue because it's deoxygenated blood. Uh, this is one of the few places in the circulation where the corresponding artery has less oxygen than the corresponding vein. All right. Um, and so this is the pulmonary artery. So these are pulmonary veins right here. The other place that it flip-flops is in the umbilical artery and vein for a fetus. So, and there's actually two hidden on this side, but there's pulmonary veins that come back to the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, <clears throat> we go through the uh, left AV valve, which is also known as the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And then it goes into the left ventricle. Again, note that the arrows are now red to show the oxygenation. And then from the left ventricle, it goes to the, what's called the systemic circulation. Notice again the thick walls. As the left ventricle pumps, you can just fairly see the edge of it here. Hiding underneath this valve is the aortic semilunar valve, or sometimes just known as the aortic valve. And then that leads to the aorta. This is the largest artery in the body, right? So um, there's the aorta right here and then from the aorta it branches off and eventually goes to the rest of the body <clears throat> goes through smaller and smaller vessels has exchange in the cells uh, <clears throat> to get oxygen and then comes back eventually to larger and larger vessels and empties most of it back into the right atrium from the su uh, superior vena cave at the top inferior vena cave at the bottom and the pulmonary circulation uh, then uh, is dictated from the right side and largely the systemic circulation is dictated from the left side. There's also some blood that comes back um, via uh, the uh, sinus that we have uh, in terms of uh, the right side. And so that drains the blood from the heart itself. So that's the coronary circulation. And again, the whole point of this is to, you know, see that it's the pressure differences that dictate blood flow, right? And, you know, if we want to kind of just summarize everything in, in a very simple pattern, um, the left ventricle pumps blood that eventually comes back to the right atrium. And in order to do that, remember we said it's pressure differences that dictate blood flow. So the pressure in the left ventricle at some point in time has to be greater than the pressure of the right atrium right because if it wasn't then there'd be no pressure difference and blood wouldn't move all right so uh, what's interesting is the pressure of the ventricle changes a lot while the pressure of the right atrium changes very little um, and that's uh, to go ahead and, and pump blood because that's the whole job of the, the heart it has to contract to move blood and then has to relax to fill up so that's the pumping function of it. So looking at the pressures that I just mentioned, there's a couple things to note, all right? Um, some of these pressures you're probably familiar with already. So as I mentioned before, um, most of the blood flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle, okay? Most of it is passive. It just means that as blood comes back to the right atrium, the right atrium uh, fills with blood a little bit, the atria pressure is slightly higher than the ventricular pressure and blood passively flows in to that area when we uh, 
look at um, the actual pressures though, uh, all of these have a systolic and diastolic pressure. So systole, that's the highest number. So when you see these pressures here, that's systole, that's when the heart is contracting. That's when it's pushing blood out of the chamber, whether it's an atria or a vent, uh, it was the atria or the ventricles. And then the lower pressure, right, is the diastolic pressure. That's when the pressure is resting and filling. Okay, so we report pressures typically as uh, systolic over diastolic. And just to kind of go with uh, something you're probably more familiar with initially, uh, let's look at aortic pressure. Now, we estimate aortic pressure by measuring arterial blood pressure. Uh, that was uh, one of the labs that will look at blood pressure. Uh, they do it in, in most medical situations now. I know that most dentist office, my dentist always measures blood pressure when I go in. So it's important measurement and kind of the number we use for average blood pressure, which is actually a little high now, um, they changed the standard a couple of years ago, is 120 over 80. So that's kind of most people would say that's an average blood pressure. The 120 means that's the systolic pressure. The 80 means that's the diastolic pressure. Okay. So notice the aortic pressure, even when it's relaxing, is still fairly high. All right. And so the top pressure, the systolic pressure, we'll see in the left ventricle, it matches the same, right? But the diastolic pressure, really high in the aorta, and it goes down to zero in the ventricle. So the question is, you know, why and how? Well, the why is, is pretty simple. Blood flows because of pressure differences. If the aortic pressure went to zero, blood would actually go backwards, right? Um, assuming there was some pressure in the other side, in the venous side, because blood flows because of pressure differences. So we always want new blood going across our capillaries to provide fresh oxygen for exchange. And so we have to have a continuous flow of oxygen. And the only way to do that is to maintain a pressure head, to maintain a pressure that's pushing blood through. And the way we do that is we maintain that with the elasticity of the large arteries, especially the aorta. Uh, if you took anatomy at DVC, uh, one of the things that most classes make you do is a tissue drawing at the beginning of the semester where you look at, you know, I don't know 25 tissues or so and uh, draw them and kind of get used to using the microscope and histology involved with the class. And, things like that. Well, the tissue that we call elastic tissue is actually aortic tissue. And then you see all the little, looks like elastic bands in the aorta when we see that. And it's the elasticity that maintains the arterial blood pressure at 80, right? So that's, that's what it is. Now, when we look at ventricular pressure, we see its peak pressure is 120 and the diastolic pressure is zero. Okay. The reason why it has to go to zero is once the left ventricle pumps blood, and it doesn't pump all the blood, we'll, we'll see, talk about that later, okay, there's always some left. So um, it has to fill, and in order to fill, its pressure has to be less than the pressure of the atria that's filling it. Since atrial pressure doesn't normally get over five, then ventricular pressure has to go down to zero to be able to fill. So when the ventricle relaxes, the pressure goes down to zero, the pressure becomes less than the atrial pressure, and blood moves passively from the atria to the ventricle. So uh, we'll talk about you know, some of the more th uh, intricate details of this process when we do the cardiac uh, cycle. Uh, but that's kind of how it works. So this is kind of you know, a couple rules of thumbs. You should know these different pressures. And note, note both pressures, whether it's the right atrium or the left atrium, have uh, diastolic pressures of five, so they don't go very high under normal circumstances, and then a uh, pressure down to about zero uh, during diastole. Uh, the right ventricle has a peak pressure of about 15, so its systolic pressure is 15. Its diastolic is zero, so we say it's 15 over zero. Now the right ventricular pressure is higher than the atrial pressure because it does have to generate more pressure. It does have to move blood further. 
but it's only pumping to the lungs, which are literally adjacent to the heart, right? I mean, remember that the, you know, one side of the lungs has the cardiac notch, right? And that cardiac notch uh, is uh, physically a place to put the heart in the thoracic cavity. So um, the lungs are, you know, is pretty close. So since we don't have to pump them very far, we don't have to overcome much resistance. Uh, one of the principles we'll learn later is the longer the tube, the greater the distance we have to move something, uh, the greater the pressure we'll have to have in order to overcome the resistance. And so as we move farther and farther away from the heart, we need a higher and higher pressure. So again, uh, just kind of complete it all in one sentence, the pressures of the right and left atria are five over zero uh, normally. The pressure of the right ventricle is 15 over zero, and the pressure of the left ventricle is 120 over zero. And again, this represents uh, the pressure uh, in terms of your systolic pressure. So as an example, if someone had hypertension, that's the scientific name for high blood pressure, where let's say their blood pressure was 140 over 100. All right, so let's say their aortic pressure, which we estimate with a blood pressure cuff, was 140 over 100. That means this number right here in the left ventricle, unless there was something wrong with that valve, the aortic semilunar valve, would be 140. So whatever the pressure in the ventricle is, it gets expressed into the pressure of the aorta. Okay? Um, also, we measure it in lab, uh, venous pressure. Uh, just to kind of mention that your veins have pressure. Uh, your veins are normally going to have a pressure that's going to be higher than, you know, five-ish, because remember the atrial pressure is going to be five over zero in either of the atria. And for blood to go back to the atria, the pressure outside of that in the, you know, for the right atrium, the vena cavas, uh, and the left atrium, the uh, pulmonary veins, right? Uh, it has to be higher. So the venous pressure, as we kind of mentioned in the lab, is about 4 to 10. Now notice right here, it's not a slash like it is. It's This is one number. There's not a systolic and diastolic pressure by the time we get to the capillaries and beyond. So there's not a, a, a systolic and diastolic pressure. There's a continuous flow, and that continuous flow is 4 over 10. Uh, so most people are between 4 and 10. And that uh, represents atrial pressure, okay? Um, and again, that's going to be above zero. That ensures blood flow going back to the heart, all right? So that's what we're looking at for that one. Uh, this is kind of a summary of some of the things we said already. We're looking at oxygen saturation and things like that. And so if you'll notice... Here's my left ventricle, blood gets pushed out the aorta, right? Notice it's the bright red. That came from the lungs picking up oxygen, right? So that's my pulmonary circuit from my right ventricle to the capillaries of the lungs to pick up oxygen. So we go from blue to the red and then back to the left ventricle from the left ventricle, pump to the rest of the body. We notice we have all of these differences here. Right, where we have uh, exchange in most of these capillary systems. We'll see these two are a little different. Uh, later we'll talk about them. And the blue are, is the venous network returning back to the right atrium. So as we said before, the oxygen saturation in the systemic side, where it's highly oxygenated in normal persons, about 99% saturated. And in the tissues in the lungs, it's about 70% saturated. So that's represented by the red versus the blue. And again, just to kind of connect it to blood, right? Uh, remember when oxygen is carried by hemoglobin, it's called oxyhemoglobin, right? And that turns our blood that nice red color. That's why we represent it red over here. But when oxygen unloads from hemoglobin, we call that deoxyhemoglobin, right? And that turns it blue, and that's what came up with cyanosis. So that's why they represent it in blue. Again, there's still a pretty large amount of oxygen in the venous side, uh, but it's, you know, saturation is about 70%. Uh, 
All right, so uh, we have valves that I mentioned in the heart, and uh, we see them at the exit of each of the large chambers. All right, since we've got four chambers, we have four valves in the heart. This shows uh, the left side of the heart, and it shows the two valves. All right, so again, the uh, valves uh, we'll look at again right here, and we'll come back to those. So uh, just a quick summary of all the valves. The valve between the right atrium and the left atrium uh, is called the uh, right atrioventricular or right AV valve. Sometimes it's just known as the bicuspid valve right here. Uh, the valve exiting the right ventricle is called the pulmonic valve or pulmonary semilunar valve. The valve going between the right atrium, sorry, the, on the left side, left atrium and the left ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. It's called the left AV valve, the left atrioventricular valve. It's also known as the bicuspid valve because it's only got two cusps or because it looks uh, like a miter. A miter is a name for like the Pope's hat. It's got two sides to it, basically. Um, the mitre has uh, two sides, so the mitral valve having two cusps, that's where the name comes from. So this has got three names, the left AV valve, bicuspid mitral valve, and then hiding, you just see the very edge of it right there uh, underneath the pulmonary trunk would be the aortic or uh, aortic semilunar valve uh, right there. So those are the, the valves that we have there. And the job of all of the valves, no matter where they're located, is to ensure one-way flow of blood. We don't want blood going backwards. We don't ever want to have what they call retrograde blood. We want blood always being pushed forward. And so that's the job of the valve. And we're not going to worry too much about the structure of the valves. In anatomy, you probably learned that even though these have the same function, the job is to prevent backflow of blood, they have different structures. So the AV valves are sometimes known as parachute valves and uh, they have the, the papillary muscle and the chordae tendine, and that all helps to prevent the backflow. While the semilunar valves are called semilunar valves because they look like half moons, and when blood starts to go backwards as the ventricular pressure decreases to zero, uh, blood starts to move backwards, and to prevent that, these little pockets fill up and then uh, close off the the chamber uh, so you can't go backwards you can go forwards so those are the kind of the, the differences and all we care about is the valves assure one-way flow so you should know the valves things like that um, this is a top view it's kind of hard to, to get uh, in your head but what we've done is we basically chopped off the atria here right from looking at the superior portion so from the top and now we're looking at the valve. So here is my tricuspid valve, because you can see one, two, three cusps, right? That would be my right side. Here's the bicuspid valve, so it's only got two cusps, one on this side, one on the other. Here are my semilunar valves, so I've got three for each of those. Um, and so this is the aortic one, and this is the pulmon pulmonic one, or pulmonary one. So all of our valves have three cusps in our heart, except for the mitral valve, which only has two. And that has to do with the different pressures that each one has to overcome uh, in terms of preventing uh, backflow, things like that. So the aortic valve needs to be able to be much more hardy. And surprisingly, from a physical standpoint, a two-cusp valve uh, is more resilient than a three-cusp valve is. So that's why we have it there. A couple other things about the heart that are important. Um, most of your heart is cardiac muscle. So like 99% is cardiac muscle. And then there's some other stuff that holds it together and, and things like that. So to a large portion, it's cardiac muscle. Um, the heart is connected by gap junctions, uh, sort of. And what we mean by that is not all of the cells are interconnected. Uh, most of the atrial cells connect to other atrial cells in some way via gap junctions. Uh, and the same is true of the ventricle, but ventricular cells and atrial cells are not connected directly like they are shown in this picture. Uh, remember when we talked about the three modes of communication in the class, one of the modes of communication uh, 
was direct cytoplasmic transfer. And the heart was an example of all three modes of communication. So these connexons, these direct cytoplasmic transfers, um, allow basically the electricity in the heart to be passed from one cell to the other uh, very easily. Okay, so um, the heart is this coordinated uh, unit uh, of electricity and it has to be able to be coordinated in order to function normally. And we'll talk about it later, but that's called a functional syncytium, what the heart needs to be able to do, functional syncytium. So uh, here's the idea of a syncytium. A syncytium just means, so the word syncytium has the word sync in it, right? In sync, right? Um, so uh, the uh, sync means it's together, right? Um, and so it's a network of interconnected cells, and the functional means that it works together. Um, so uh, what really allows the heart to work that way are these intercalated discs, right? Some people say intercalated, but intercalated discs. And it, they have the gap junctions, which allows the, the proteins, connexons, to, to talk to each other. And each cell then uh, can pass information directly to the next cell. And again, this only occurs um, in the atria and then separately in the ventricle. We have a different way to get the information from one to the other, and we'll kind of talk about how it works. So this basically uh, shows the uh, different uh, parts of the intercalated disc that allow us to, to do that. Um, we also have in the heart uh, a couple other things that are important. Uh, the heart is again divided into four chambers, and in order to divide the heart into four chambers, we need different septa. Okay, uh, septums some people use, but technically septa is plural of uh, septum, uh, but septums is, is appropriate uh, as well. But the correct scientific term is septa, and that's the tissue that divides the heart chambers. We have three different septa within the heart. Um, and so the one that goes across that divides the atria and the ventricles is called the atrioventricular septum. And it goes all the way across and the same septum basically divides both atria and both ventricles. Okay, um, So that's the atrioventricular or sometimes AV septum. Uh, that's the important one that we're kind of talking about here. Uh, because that does not allow electricity to pass directly from the atria to the ventricles. All right. And if you kind of look at the way the heart's designed, it makes sense. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the conduction system. All right. So that's the job of the atrioventricular septum. Uh, we also have uh, a septum between each of the other chambers. So the two atria are divided by the interatrial septum. So you see that here. This is the hard to see, but the grayish dotted line here. So inter between atria, right? So interatrial septum up here. If you remember, um, that is what is open in a fetus, right? For the circulation. Remember the forma, uh, foramen ovale, which becomes the fossa ovalis, right? During uh, development, right? Uh, and closes that hole. And then you have the interventricular septum, this large area right here, oh, sorry, that also allows um, for electricity to pass through the bottom of the heart easily. That those little, this will have the bundle branches in it, but also serves as uh, the core tissue that separates the, the two ventricles. So again, uh, electrical signals can move within the atria and within the ventricle, but it has to pass through the interventricular ventricular septum uh, to, to go from one place to another. All right, we'll see that, what I mean by that. We talk about the conduction system. So one of the things that's interesting about the cardiac cells is that there are uh, a small portion of the cells um, that are autorhythmic, all right? And so autorhythmic's up here. If you play hangman, it's a great hangman, hangman work, especially with non-scientists, right? So uh, auto means self, and rhythmic refers to uh, beating in this case. And so there are groups of autorhythmic cells that can spontaneously generate their own action potentials. And uh, these autorhythmic cells um, 
are referred to as nodal cells. And there's not a whole lot of nodal cells within the human body. Uh, would, there's not a whole lot of tissue that can generate their own electricity, basically. And smooth muscle in the gut can do it. Uh, we, we won't talk about it, but they're called basal electrical rhythms, where your gut has these waves of uh, rhythmic uh, uh, electrical activity. Uh, but for the heart, we'll talk about it, and they're the cardiac nodes. And, and you already probably are familiar with a couple of them. Um, the SA node or sinoatrial node, which is located in the superior lateral portion of the right atrium up here. The AV node, which stands for atrioventricular, it's located at the bottom of the uh, tissue that makes up the uh, right atrial as well. So both of these are associated with the top on the one end and the bottom of the other, the right atrium. And then you may not have learned in anatomy, they're also scattered kind of randomly throughout the ventricles what they call ventricular nodes or just V nodes. And uh, these also um, uh, can be self-beating, all right? So those are the autorhythmic cells of the ventricles. Now, the SA node sets the basic heart pattern. We'll look at in lab a little bit what the SA node does, and we'll talk about it a little bit here. Um, but uh, the SA node spontaneously depolarizes because it's a nodal tissue. And under normal circumstances, uh, that passes the electricity to the atria. And you can see that electricity purple here. That gets picked up by the AV node. So notice it goes from white to purple. Okay. And then the atrial ventricular septum, right, across that divides the atria and the ventricles, that blocks the electricity from going directly to the ventricles, which is a good thing. Um, but the AV node picks up this electricity. It slows it down a little bit, actually, uh, and then goes what's called the bundle of hiss. That's this purple line here. And then it splits to the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. So there's just two pathways, one to the right side, one to the left side. So you can see them right here at the bottom, these little purple arrows that have grown. Okay. And then those move back up, and you can kind of see the little branches here. Those are Purkinje fibers. Okay, so you see it right here, Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers then excite the ventricular muscle, and the ventricular muscle then contracts. Now, that's really important when we look at the heart itself, all right? So let's go back and look right here. So, again, we're going to kind of draw in the the things right here so let me draw them in okay so my SA node would be up here right and this nice pink I'm drawing in in the upper portion of the right atrium and my AV node would be right here right part of my uh, right atrium and so uh, when this contracts right we want this wave of depolarization to spread out right so it'll spread out across and then we want it to go down and what we want to do is we want to have the atria actually kind of curves down right we want the atria to push the blood that way right down to the ventricle and so it's nice if we contract the atria from the superior portion down towards the inferior portion of the heart that makes sense but if that electricity kept on going right so if my electricity kept on going it would just keep on going down this way and what would happen is the atria right if it was directly connected to the ventricles it would cause the ventricles to start to contract right and then that would push blood down towards the bottom of the heart notice down here there's no exits right the exit of the heart is up here in the aorta so I can't have blood, right, being pushed to the bottom of the heart. When you brush your teeth tonight, if you don't understand what I mean, uh, squeeze the toothpaste from the top, right? Nothing happens. It all goes down to the bottom. There's no exit, right? So we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So uh, in the heart, what happens is, again, here's my SA note up here in the pink. I'll make it purple. 
and here's my a oh, sorry here's my AV node here right and so once the AV node picks things up what it does is it sends it to the bundle of hiss and then that splits up to the left and right bundle branches right and then that goes up to the Purkinje fibers and what that does then is that allows the ventricle to contract from the bottom up and you know push blood out where the major chambers are coming out of the top of the heart so it's a much more efficient way to pump blood uh, so that's why we have that electrical conduction system so one of the problems that we have with this system is each cardiac node has its own inherent rate the sa node if we were to cut it out and put it in a beaker of salt water ringer solution uh, for humans it would continue to be probably for about an hour at about 70 to 100 beats per minute that's that genetically set inherent rate that we've discussed a couple times in class um, the av node has its own inherent rhythm and that's about 40 to 50 beats per minute while the ventricular nodes only beat at about 20 to 30 beats per minute now we've already mentioned the idea of what we call the functional syncytium the heart has to beat as a coordinated unit we have to fill the atria with blood right and then push it to the ventricles and we have to fill the ventricles with blood and then push it out to where the places we need it if we can't do that then we're not going to have the heart be an effective pump and if it gets too ineffective we die so what we need is we need one area to control the heart and the other ones to kind of listen to that control right and so what happens in the human body is the fastest node sets the speed for the cardiac muscle all of it and that's the pacemaker so that's why oftentimes we call the SA node the pacemaker okay um, so the pacemaker sets the basic rate of the heart and what it does is it inhibits the slower nodes and uh, without getting too much detail it makes them farther away from threshold so the AV node and the ventricular nodes are basically deactivated and so the SA node sets the the pacemaker rhythm and what this nodal system uh, really works for it's a backup system uh, one of the problems uh, physiologically is the SA node because it has the ability to be autorhythmic uh, like we've kind of talked about a couple times when you get something physiologically you often have to give something up in return and what the nodal tissue has given up in return uh, to some extent is it's really easily damaged it's the kind of the most easily damaged tissue in the heart by far so it's easy to damage SA node or any of the types of the nodal tissue so if the SA node gets messed up right then and it doesn't function then the atrioventricular node right would become the fastest node now and that would serve as the pacemaker right so what would happen to your average heart rate it would go from 70 to 100 down about 40 to 50 beats per minute okay uh, because now since the SA node is not functioning that's the pass fastest pacemaker and through overdrive suppression uh, we would now uh, turn off the ventricular nodes now if your right atrium was completely damaged and neither of the nodal tissue worked your ventricular nodes would take over and you've got a number of them um, and that would set the basic heart pattern and your heart rate would go down about 20 30 beats per minute would you be alive yes uh, would you be very functional no but the whole point is it helps to uh, give a backup system so you don't die okay since uh even though we're not quite done with this concept uh, this video is already getting kind of long so let's uh, uh, start a new one and uh, look at some some other factors because we still have a number of things to talk about in terms of the heart and heart rate and control and conduction and things like that 